It is a pleasure to introduce you, um, Dr. Daniel Tornero, which is our today's um, speaker. Um, uh, <clears throat> Daniel is, um, has a PhD in neuroscience uh, from the University of Castilla-La Mancha here in Spain, and has more than 20 years of experience in the field of uh, neural stem cells. The scientific interest has been oriented towards exploration of new strategies for the study and treatment of neurological disorders, in particular ischemic stroke. He spent most of his postdoctoral time at Lund Stem Cell Center in Sweden, where he developed cell therapies based on human-induced pluripotent stem cells for ischemic stroke as well. Uh, since uh, 2019, Daniel is an assistant professor at the University of Barcelona and head of the laboratory of neural stem cells and brain damage. Uh, his research is focused on the study of functional neuronal integration in cell therapies applied to brain injuries and neurodegenerative diseases. He also participates in projects related to the development of models, both in vivo and in vitro, that help to explore neurodegenerative processes and diseases that affect neurodevelopment. And now with this, I would like just to uh, thank um, Daniel for uh, um, uh, his uh, willingness to share his work with us today and, um, and just give him uh, the floor right away. So Daniel, please go ahead and thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Miguel, for this nice introduction. And uh, thank you to Cybernet for uh, allowing me to share my research um today here and uh, i would like also to thank everyone for being here uh, listening to me today so uh, today uh, as uh, miguel was saying i'm gonna uh, talk about functional brain reconstruction using stem cell based therapy uh, for uh, uh, to repair the brain after damage um, i will uh, first of all i would like to give uh, an overview of what I'm gonna say today. This is the work developed uh, for the last five years in my laboratory. Uh, part of this was done in the stem cell center in Lund. And uh, the last three years I have been working here in uh, Barcelona where I'm now uh, as a assistant professor in the University of Barcelona. The, I, I first want to uh, introduce the topic where I'm uh, that I'm going to talk today about, and is related with the uh, capacity to repair that we have uh, in the brain after a damage. I will uh, mainly use the, the model of ischemic stroke as a model of brain damage, but this technology can be used for many other disorders. And I have been using um, many different techniques, most of them related with the functional integration of the, of the neurons after the transplantation. And what I want to uh, try to convince you is that uh, we are able to repair the brain after damage, an adult brain. And uh, after injection of these neural stem cells into the brain, we are able to, um, to get these cells connected to the neural network, and we are able to repair the function of these uh, damaged areas. Uh, this image was um, included in, the, um, in a... a review that was uh, published last year in uh, Frontiers and uh, in Cell and Developmental Biology. Uh, so uh, during my talk, I will talk about the different uh, techniques that I'm going to use. First of all, I would like to start introducing the kind of cells that we are using. And these cells are um, called uh, long-term expandable neuroepithelial-like stem cells or LTNS cells. And these cells are generated uh, from a skin uh, biopsy of a human donor. After a process of uh, reprogramming, uh, we are able to generate uh, um, iPS cells. And then uh, through the process that we call uh, neuralization, we are uh, going through different steps, uh, embryo body formation, rosette formation, and uh, some other kinds of rosettes. Uh, until we uh, arrive to the LTNS cells that are uh, neuroepithelial-like cells. So they are similar to the cells that we can find in the subventricular zone. And uh, the, some of the 
good uh, characteristics or features that these cells has is that they are long-term expandable. So we can uh, grow them for a long time, we can expand them, we can um, maintain for a long time for many passages, and we can freeze them and thaw them several times. After applying a protocol of differentiation, we can generate different kinds of uh, neural uh, differentiated cells, like for example, uh, neurons uh, staying in green with uh, tubulin in this case, and also uh, astrocytes staying with GFAP. Uh, and uh, something that is important is to um, highlight that these neurons are uh, electrically uh, active, so they can be stimulated electrically as the normal neurons. So this is the cells that we use in our experiments. And uh, uh, first, I, I want just to introduce the first uh, evidence that we had about uh, the use of these cells in uh, regenerative medicine. That was this paper published in 2013 in, in the journal called Brain. And uh, in this case, we were using this model, this ischemic stroke model that affects the cortical areas of the brain. And we were using these cells, these um, LTNS cells, to try to repair this damage. Uh, we demonstrated in this first um, paper uh, how the animals transplanted with these cells were able to um, recover faster than the ones without the transplantation um, after suffering this, this stroke damage. Um, now I'm going to go through uh, like a general uh, characterization of the cells that we are generating uh, after transplantation at the different time points. And this is just to give you a, a, an idea of how, how is the transplant, uh, how many different kinds of cells we can generate uh, from these grafted cells, from these uh, neural stem cells. So the first time point that we, are, uh, that we used is the two months time point after transplantation. And in this case, we can see how most of the cells are still immature. Uh, we have many HUD cells, uh, neural precursors or, or progenitors. Uh, we have also many DCX positive cells, double cortin positive cells. But we uh, can see already um, uh, like 10 or 15 percent of new and positive cells, FOX3 positive cells that are already mature neurons. Um, uh, that at two months time point are uh, arriving to this uh, level of maturation. Uh, importantly, we can also detect at this time point some uh, cells that are expressing specific markers of the cortex, like TVR1, um, showing also morphology of pyramidal neurons at that stage. Um, and uh, in the downer image, you can see also the staining for uh, this TVR1 that is a, a marker of deeper layers of the cortex. But uh, most importantly, uh, when we go in the time, we can see how this uh, transplant is uh, uh, changing with the time, is maturing. For example, at four months time point after the transplantation, we can see how uh, the number of new and positive cells is increased. We have many uh, mature neurons in this case. Uh, most of these cells are also positive for KGA a marker for glutamatergic neurons, that are the neurons that we expect to have in the cortex, uh, at the, in the adult brain. So most of the neurons that we generate are also glutamatergic, ex um, excitatory neurons. Uh, we also can detect uh, still some immature neurons and also um, astrocytes in our transplanted cells. So we can not only generate neurons, but also astrocytes in vivo after transplantation. This is all related with the grafted cells, but we were also interested in knowing uh, what kind of cells are inside the transplant, but are not belonging to the transplant. So trying to see how integrated is the tissue in the brain of the rat. And uh, at this level, we were um, observing this uh, EVA1 positive cells, so microglia uh, inside the transplant that is not belonging to the transplant, is not uh, derived from the transplant, but is present inside, so it's belonging to the, uh, so no, they, they are host cells, not uh, grafted cells, but also GFP, GFAP positive cells, so astrocytes from the host, from the rat, that is in, inter, uh, included into the transplant, in the tissue of the transplant. So if we go further to six months time point, we can detect how this progression is uh, in, in increasing. So uh, the new and positive cells are um, in numbers is higher. We only can see a few DCX positive cells. So the number of neuroblasts are, is reduced. 
and the number of um, cells that are proliferating is uh, very low. Uh, the only cells that we can detect that are K67 positive, so proliferative cells, they are not belonging to the transplant, so they are not human origin. So um, importantly, we can detect also many different specific markers for the, from the cortical neurons, specific of the upper layers like brain two or sub B2, but also from other layers like um, TBR1 or CT2, more typical from the deeper layers of the, of the cortex. So all, all the different kinds of neurons that we can find in the cortex, we can also find them in the, in the transplant. But not only uh, neurons we can find, as I told you before, we can also find astrocytes at the later time points. We can see a few uh, human origin uh, astrocytes staying here with SC123 and specific marker for human astrocytes uh, and also oligodendrocytes. In this case, most of the cells that are um, stained with this oligodendrocyte specific, specific markers, uh, SOX2 so in this case, are more located or are um, concentrated in the corpus callosum, in the deeper area of the transplant. So with this brief introduction of how is the transplant, I, I will focus now in the main topic of uh, my work, that is study the integration, the functional integration of the transplanted cells. And I will start with this first paper published in, also in Brain 2017, where we described uh, the cells, uh, how the cells that we transplant uh, are receiving information from different parts of the brain. So we wanted to study uh, if our cells, the cells that we transplant into the rat brain are able to receive uh, synaptic inputs from uh, the host brain, in this case, the rat brain. So the first thing that we did is to observe in the area of the transplants using um, immune electron microscopy, if we could detect these structures and uh, we, we confirmed that we could find uh, structures that are um, very well known as uh, synaptic contacts that are from the host to the, the grafted cell. The grafted cells is visible in green in this picture and is, um, we, we are able to detect this because it has GFP and we can stain the GFP with these uh, very dark, uh, dense um, spots that you can see in the image. So we confirm the presence of synaptic contacts from the host to the uh, grafted cell. But uh, we wanted to explore where are these cells uh, located. So the cells that are connected to the graft are located in different parts of the brain and we wanted to explore where are these located, where are these cells located. So to do that, we were using a very specific tool uh, called rabies virus monosynaptic tracing that is based in the rabies virus uh, modified uh, where we are re removing the, the G protein from, the, from this virus. That is the protein that allows the virus to cross from one synapse to the other and infect the different neurons. So when we remove the G protein and we include um, a reporter, in this case is uh, M-cherry, that is, it will stain the, the neuron with um, in red. Uh, and then we put an envelope in this uh, rabies virus uh, from a different kind of virus. This we call pseudotype rabies virus, stained with M-cherry. And this is what we use for um, this technique. In parallel, we, we design uh, um, a construct that is uh, that presents inside a, a reporter that is histone GFP, the, the um, receptor for the envelope that we have included in the rabies virus and also the, the G protein of the rabies virus. And this we included into the lentiviral vector uh, units and uh, we call it uh, lentiviral tracing vector. So what we do with this um, technology is to uh, infect our cells before transplanting with the lentiviral tracing vector, including this TVA and the G protein, and then uh, transplant the cells in our model. And sometime later, we are injecting the rabies virus. Uh, in this way, the rabies virus will only infect our transplanted cells, but are because are the ones that are mm, transformed by the lentiviral tracing vector. And this rabies virus will uh, travel to one synapse uh, mm, across the, this uh, structure uh, because this cell is expressing the G protein. 
this uh, infection with the rabies virus will not go to the next uh, neuron because these uh, trace neurons will not have the G protein that is necessary for this infection. So using this technology we were using in our, in our model, uh, we were able to detect where are the cells in the brain of the rat that are connected to our transplant through a synapsis. And in these images, you can see how we observe um, the, the trace neurons into the, the graph that are um, GFP positive. So those we call starter neurons that are the first uh, neurons to be infected with the rabies virus. And we can see also how uh, some of the cells in the host brain are also stained with this GFP. So they are connected to the transplant and uh, because of that, they are infected with the rabies virus. And we observe these cells uh, very close to the transplant in the cortical areas, but we also can see this in far, uh, in very far areas of the brain, like for example, the contralateral hemisphere in the cortex, also the um, claustrum of, of, the, um, of these cortical areas that this structure is located in the, in the um, uh, ventral part of the cortex. And importantly, uh, we were uh, also observing a huge uh, concentration of cells infected with the rabies virus located in the thalamus. And uh, in these images, I'm showing a specific uh, nuclei of the thalamus where we can find these uh, neurons uh, that are traced with the rabies virus, uh, so connected with our transplanted cells. And we know that this is a relay uh, step that the information coming from the uh, periphery of the body uh, it, it takes to go to the cortex. So first, the information is arriving to the thalamus, to these kind of neurons, and then arriving uh, after a second synapsis to the cortex. So this is the, the, the known relay um, step of the information, uh, uh, sensitive information coming from the periphery of the, um, of the body. So uh, we conclude that uh, this, um, this distribution of these cells connected to our transplant are similar to the ones in the normal animal. So the, this is happening uh, in a specific way. These kind of synapses are forming in a specific way, but we wanted to know also if these synapses were functional, were able to send information. And to do that, we did two different kinds of um, studies, uh, experiments. The first one was using um, the um, optogenetics um, tools. Uh, in this case, channel rhodopsin, that as you probably know, is able to um, induce an activation into the neuron when we illuminate these uh, cells that are expressing this uh, channel uh, with a specific light, in this, case, in this case, blue light. So if we um, express this um, channel rhodopsin in a neuron and we illuminate this neuron or the fibers and we record from the cells that are connected to this neuron, we will be able to observe a response in this uh, second neuron. So what we did is to inject in our uh, rat brain after the transplantation, this channel of rhodopsin into the thalamus of these animals, uh, trying to target these cells that we could see stained with the rabies virus. And then we um, confirm that these grafted cells in the cortex uh, recording from them, we could observe a response when we were illuminating these fibers in acute slices in these animals transplanted with the, with the human uh, LTNS cells. The second study that we did to confirm this uh, activity or this information arriving to the cells is in the alive animal. We were uh, opening a window into the, um, the head of the animal to see where the transplant is located in this. Uh, image, you can see how this, uh, we can um, specifically see where the transplant is located because the GFP positive cells are visible uh, using the proper um, filter. And in these cells, we put one electrode, uh, external electrode in this area of the graft, and we were able to stimulate the rat in a particular way, in a specific way, and we detect this response into the grafted cells. So we were able to uh, demonstrate that these cells are receiving information from the periphery, uh, sensitive information from the periphery. So this is more or less a summary of this first um, uh, paper that we were publishing. But uh, after closing all of this, we 
had another topic that we wanted to explore. And this was related with not only uh, which cells are connecting to our transplant, but also where are our transplanted cells projecting to, and if they are forming uh, functional synapses with other areas of the brain. And in this paper, uh, in this PNAS paper published in 2021, last year, um, we were able to uh, explore this topic. So, and the first thing that we did is to try to explore where the projections uh, starting in our transplant are going. And to do that in the images, you can see how is the morphology of the transplant in, the, in panel B. Uh, this is covering all the cortex. Uh, in the panel D, you can see how is the limit to the area of the damage, so to the damage, stroke damage area. And also in the, in the C panel, you can see uh, how many fibers are crossing through the corpus callosum to the other hemisphere. And this is where we put our attention because we think that this is a preferential area where our cells were projecting. And what we did is to explore where th these projections are finishing, are ending up. And uh, taking this contralateral hemisphere uh, opposite to the transplant, we could, uh, using this uh, uh, immune electron microscopy again, we were able to detect these structures, these synapses, in this case, um, in the other direction. So axonal terminals arriving to this area of the cortex and contacting with host cells. So our cells were able to send the projections to the other hemisphere of the brain and connect to a specific neurons located in that side of the, of the brain. And in the, in the same case as we did in the previous paper, we explore uh, these um, uh, synapses using the, the rabies virus monosynaptic tracing. And uh, what we did in this case is to inject this uh, lentiviral tracing vector and the rabies virus in the contralateral hemisphere. As you can see in the image, in the, in the red spot, uh, this is the area where we inject both viruses. And the rabies virus, uh, if the cells are connected, will be transferred to the other hemisphere. Uh, and in this image, you can see how a few cells are located in the area of the transplant, are uh, stained with the M. cherry, so infected with the rabies virus. And also inside the transplant, you can see a few cells. Uh, in the downer image, you can see a higher magnification of one of these uh, cells, uh, uh, example of one of these cells that are from the transplant and are connecting to the um, other hemisphere of the rat brain and infected with the rabies virus using this monosynaptic tracing tool. So uh, importantly, we could see how these traced cells that are in the transplant and are connecting to the other hemisphere are also positive for a specific marker called SATB2 that is in the cortex of the normal animals and is specific from the neurons that are connecting both hemispheres. So these trans uh, um, connection neurons are specifically positive for this sub B2. So uh, not only the cells in the transplant were connecting to the hemisphere, but they were also becoming the kind of neurons that they should be if they connect to this area, to this specific area. So this was uh, very interesting, but we wanted to explore also the capacity of our, of the projections generated by the transplant to be able to be myelinated in this case. So, the first thing that we did with the electron microscopy is to observe in different areas how the, the GFP positive axons were uh, myelinated. You can see three different images in different parts of the brain uh, showing how the uh, GFP positive axons are myelinated um, with uh, surrounded by myelin in, uh, um, in the corpus callosum, in the ipsilateral cortex and in the contralateral cortex. We were able also to observe the axonal um, myelination at different stages, as you can see in the downer image, the A is um, poorly um, myelinated axon. In the middle one, you can see a, a middle uh, myelinated uh, axon. And in the C uh, panel, you can see the, the complete myelination of an axon um, originated from the, from the transplant. And as I was telling you before, we were able to generate also a few oligodendrocytes from our transplant. And in the um, 
image in your right, you can see how uh, some of these oligodendrocytes originated from the transplant, human uh, positive, in this case with a human uh, mitochondria marker. We could observe how these oligodendrocytes are able to generate the myelin and, uh, and this uh, covering the, the axons of the, of the rat and uh, generating this myelinization of the, um, of the uh, host brain. So not only the axons can be myelinated, but also the oligodendrocytes coming from the transplant are able to myelinate other axons. And finally, going more for the functional uh, perspective, we wanted to explore how our cells are contributing to the recovery of the animal. And to do that, we were using a, a behavioral test called cylinder test, where we put the animal in a, in a glass cylinder uh, or transparent cylinder, where we can count how many times the animal is touching with the, uh, both uh, upper limbs. So uh, this uh, was done at six months time point after the transplantation. And in this case was the best um, test, behavioral test to detect the efficient recovery of the animals after the transplantation. If you observe this uh, graph, you will see how after the damage, uh, there was a preferential use of the um, ipsilateral side of the animal because the contralateral side is damaged, is uh, affected by the, some kind of paralysis. So this preferential use of one of the limbs is completely um, uh, removed or, or ab abolished by the transplantation of cells that you can see in the right side of the, of the graph, how the level, the use of both limbs is uh, 50%, so it's the same. And we use this model uh, to try to see how is the contribution of the uh, functional activity of our cells uh, to, the, to this functional recovery that we could observe. And to do that, in this case, we use another uh, tool, uh, optogenetic tool, in this case, um, allorhodopsin, that this uh, channel that when you express this channel into the, a cell is able to uh, completely uh, abolish the activity, uh, remove completely the activity of the, um, of the neuron that is uh, with this channel, as you can see in the image there. So what we did is to uh, introduce our cells uh, infected with um, or, or um, expressing this allorhodopsin, and in the brain after this we install uh, optical fiber to illuminate the cortical area where the transplant is located. As you can see in the image, um, this rat is um, uh, is having uh, one of these optical fibers that is. Uh, connected, this cannula is connected to an uh, optical fiber to illuminate the area of the transplant. When we did this experiment and we silent completely the activity of the of the transplant, we could we could not see a difference in the use of uh, one or the other um, side of the of the body, as you can see in the image. But what it was very interesting is that in all the cases. Um, in all the animals, the number of touches with both uh, limbs was um, statistically significantly different. So we wanted to explore why this was happening. And in, in this image, you can see how, in this case, both uh, paws were reduced in the number of touches. And uh, this, um, we were thinking about the explanation for this because we were expecting the use of one uh, limb or the other, and uh, we think that once the neurons are completely uh, integrated into the circuitry of this brain, when you shut down the, this area of the brain, is not only affecting this side, but also the other one, because both um, hemispheres are connected through the synapses. So, um, we, we start thinking that uh, the, the uh, silencing of one area of the brain is not only affecting this side, but also both. And to, come to, to try to explain or to demonstrate this uh, hypothesis, we did uh, a control experiment where we were injecting the allorhodopsin in both sides of the cortex, in both um, hemispheres, and we were illuminating one or the other to try to reduce uh, to, to silence the activity of these sites of the cortex. And we observe exactly the same 
um, result as we observe in our transplanted animals, that when we were sitting down one side or the other, both legs were affected in the same way. So there was not a preferential use of one side, but the, the amount of touches of both um, paws was reduced in the similar way. So we demonstrate that when, when we transplant the cells, these cells are contributing to the functional recovery in the same way as it's happening in the normal uh, intact brain without any damage. So um, to go further uh, in the last year, uh, we also published a paper uh, developed uh, in, in Stem Cell Center in Lund in the laboratory of Sal Kokaya, where we wanted to explore what will happen if we use uh, um, tissue that is human origin uh, as a um, recipient for the transplant. Because what I was showing during all this talk is related with the transplantation of human cells into an animal. But uh, we don't know what, what will happen if we transplant these cells into the human uh, tissue. So to try to explore this uh, possibility uh, or this, um, uh, this mechanism, we used uh, pieces of brain that was, were donated uh, to the laboratory uh, from uh, surgeries to generate organotypic cultures of human uh, brain cortex. And we use this as, a, uh, as the host for the transplantation of the LTNS cells. And uh, this work was done by uh, three postdocs in uh, Sal Kukaya's lab, Marita, uh, Cecilia, and uh, Sara Palma. And, and they were exploring this kind of model to try to see if the cells can be connected in the same way as we observe in the animals. And here you can see images of these kind of uh, cultures with the of organotypic cultures with the transplant. And in the image below, you can see how using electron microscopy, uh, we were able to detect these synapses form in both directions from the transplant to the slide and from the slide to the transplant. Um, also using the rabies virus technology uh, in the same way as before, we were able to demonstrate the connections from the slide to the uh, grafted cells and in the other way around from the grafted cell to the, um, to the transplant, to, 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 the, to the slide, the corti cortical slide from a human uh, patient. So um, to go one step further, we, we, were, we wanted also to see if these cells were receiving some kind of information and to do that in these um, slides, we. Uh, record with electrophysiology, electrophysiological recordings in the grafted cells to try to see if they were receiving information and we were able to detect this uh, spontaneous activity arriving to the transplanted cell. With this set of experiments, uh, this paper was published, as I said, last year in stem cell translational medicine. We demonstrate that uh, this integration of the cells, transplanted cells and the host tissue is happening also in a human-to-human -human, um, device or setup. So uh, to, to end up with my talk today, I just want to uh, comment a bit about my uh, future plans and what's uh, going on now in my laboratory in the future and, and in the future uh, projects. In this case, what I'm gonna try to incorporate is a, a, a new tool that um, we have in the lab, that is this GCAM uh, molecule or GECI. Uh, those are uh, genetically encoded uh, calcium indicators that we can use to follow in vivo the activity of the neurons because the calcium levels that we can follow with this kind of uh, molecules um, are changing with the activity of the neurons. And uh, in this kind of experiments, I have uh, very valuable help from uh, Jordi Soriano, one of our collaborators, in this case, in the physics uh, faculty of, um, of the University of Barcelona, that is developing different tools to analyze how the networks are uh, maturing or, or are integrating uh, during the process of uh, generation of the network or integration of transplants. Uh, online using this kind of uh, tools. So in this, uh, uh, using this uh, tool, we are now uh, trying to explore how the uh, LTNS cells or the human uh, progenitors 
can generate networks that are connected uh, one to each other. So the, the neurons are, um, are able to generate a, a circuit that can be connected um, uh, in, as, as a whole. And then in these uh, images, in this video, I'm showing you how uh, the activity of the um, calcium imaging is uh, in this kind of uh, cultures when they are 21 days uh, after starting the differentiation. This is a very immature um, culture where we can see very uh, random activity of the neurons without any connectivity uh, between the neurons. But if we wait for some time, this is a, a video of 32 days, we can observe how some of the uh, activities are uh, becoming uh, more uh, synchronous. So all the cells simul simultaneously are firing together in synchronous uh, events. And this is what is telling us about when the cells are connecting one to each other. So if I'm showing the last time point at uh, 48 days of uh, culture, we can see how in this case, uh, uh, sorry, in this case, uh, most of the neurons will fire together uh, in all the events being a synchronous activity. So this is telling us about how the culture is uh, getting more mature. And we can use this uh, in, in our purpose, in our model to try to explore what is happening in our brains after transplantation. So to do that, uh, we were designing in our laboratory, uh, mainly done, this work was done by uh, Clelia Introna, one of uh, the PhD students in the, in the laboratory, in the histology unit. Um, he, she was designing a lentiviral plasmid to incorporate the GCAM uh, with a puromycin selection uh, cassette. So we, we are able to um, generate the cell line that is pressing um, in a stable way, uh, the GCAM, um, in all the, the cells. Uh, and this is under the, the promoter of synapsin. So under synapsin promoter, so only the neurons will express this GCAM. So we have incorporated these particles into uh, lentivirus and uh, together with the rest of the people in my lab uh, last year and also right now, we are now using this uh, plasmid or this lentivirus to modify the LTNS cells before transplanting. And our idea is to, to use these cells in uh, the model of uh, ischemic stroke to try to see online in the animal how these uh, cells are connected and how is the dynamics of this integration, uh, functional integration of the cells into the brain. So with this, I just want to acknowledge uh, all the people in my lab and all the institutions that I belong to, also the rest of the people of the histology unit in the Faculty of Medicine in the University of Barcelona, also the, the agencies that uh, is, are trusting on us, giving us money to do our projects. Um, importantly, I want to say, thank all the people in Sal Cocaya's lab where most of the work that I have been presenting was done um, especially in the previous, uh, in, the, in the first stages of these projects. Uh, also, I would like to thank uh, Malin Parmar and Sen, Shane because they were sharing, setting with us the, the rabies virus technology. Galina, uh, Skibo and Oleg were doing all the electro, uh, electron microscopy and Carl Dicerov was helping uh, a lot with the optogenetic tools. And thank you all for listening. I'm open to get questions at this point. All right. Thank you very much, Daniel, for this uh, very uh, interesting um, talk. So the paper is now uh, open for discussion. So if you, um, you want to make any questions, please uh, use the chat option that you have in the bottom of your screen and just state your name and I will give the floor in a first come, first serve uh, basis. Um, So in the meantime that we receive the, fir, uh, the first question, let me just um, remind everyone that um, this webinar series um, uh, is, um, is now open to everyone, not only to CyberNet researchers, but everyone outside CyberNet, both uh, nationally and internationally. The, um, the webinars um, are held usually every other week 
um, always on Thursdays at um, 3 30 p.m and um, you can um, check the uh, program for the next um, six months in the uh, CBNet web page and also through the um, uh, social networks uh, from CBNet as well. So um, <clears throat> I haven't received any um, requests for questions yet. So, um, but please um, don't hesitate to uh, send me a short message with your name uh, through the chat option so I can give you the floor and you can make the questions directly to Daniel. Yeah, we have uh, the first question from um, Agua Fuster. Uh, so please um, uh, just make sure that your microphone is in on. And if you want to also turn your camera on, that's fine. And I think it will be easier for Daniel to see who is uh, posting the question. So just go ahead. Yeah, um, hello. Well, first of all, thank you for your talk. And then my question was, um, how far do you think we are uh, of applying this therapy you were explaining in real clinical cases? Okay, thank you, Alba, for the question. Um, well, uh, at, at some point, uh, uh, this is a, a common question that we uh, are getting when we explain our work. Uh, I, I'm not the only one working in this field, and, and this um, most of this research was done using a stroke model, but in many other uh, neurodegenerative diseases, this technology can be uh, in the same way uh, used. And there are other um, studies, for example, using uh, Parkinson as a model, where uh, all this technology is very close now to be uh, in the clinic. There are many clinical trials using patients that uh, are now ongoing. These transplantations with uh, stem cells in the patients started a long time ago. Um, importantly, also, I, I think it's important to highlight that in Lund, there were uh, pioneers like Ole Lindvold doing transplantations in these kind of patients, uh, Parkinsonian patients using uh, embryonic stem cells. And the results were uh, quite uh, important. And uh, now we are mm, concluding a lot of things about this uh, uh, project. So now all this field is exploding um, in, in Parkinson disease. I think very close in one or two years, we will see results very interesting with patients where we can see a, a huge um, uh, recovery of the patients with um, a lot of data to be analyzed. And I think in the same way in the, in the stroke will happen, we still have to be sure about what's the best protocol to transplant the cells. Uh, we need to know exactly, for example, how many cells and when it should be transplanted into the patient, because we know that there is a critical window where we can transplant the cells. We cannot transplant the cells a few months later after the stroke, but during the first month, the plasticity in the damaged area is still enough to, to get a good results, success with the transplantation. So all these things should be um, more or less uh, established. And we have to, to put a lot of emphasis in how we develop this technology or these protocols. But also in parallel, there are many works that has been doing, uh, is doing now in, in the world, for example, in Japan and, and US, trying to generate a um, bank of cells with um, a lot of uh, frozen vials of human cells that we can transplant into this kind of patients. This, for example, the, the, the work that uh, Lawrence Studer is doing in US or Jun Takahashi in Japan is they are trying to generate a whole uh, bank of cells that we can take to transplant once we need the cells to, to do this kind of regenerative medicine. And this is also a nice and important um, work that should be done in order to do the, this therapy more reproducible and more efficient and successful. And those are many different uh, fields or, or, or lines that are in parallel going to the, um, the close application of these kind of therapies in this kind of patient. But I think in, in stroke patients, 
There are also some clinical trials, very uh, a few of them with a few patients. But um, with the time, with a few years, we will see how this number is increasing. And, uh, and probably in uh, five or 10 years, we will see the results of this. OK, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, thank you both. Um, so um, um, again, if anybody else is interested in making a questions, um, just please so by using the um, chat option and send just a message stating your name. Um, I haven't received any other requests yet. Um, let's wait for a couple of minutes. No questions? All right. Um, if there are no more questions, then uh, we're going to close the session here. Um, not before thanking Daniel for um, um, his time and his willingness to share his work with uh, all of us. And thank you everyone for attending and remind you that um, we we'll have another webinar in um, two weeks on uh, Thursday at 3.30 p.m. Um, as always. Um, so thank you very much everyone for attending and thank you Daniel once again and I'll see you hopefully in the next uh, webinar. Have a good day. Bye-bye.